Hello everyone, I am Dr. Judy Morgan, your pets advocate from Naturally Healthy Pets. My guest today is Dr. Rob Silver, who is a brilliant veterinarian and he's kind of my go-to for all things mushroom and a few other topics, but today we're gonna to talk mushrooms. Um, hi Rob, thanks for uh, agreeing to be a guest today. Hello Judy, thank you so much for having me. So Rob has been working with the Real Mushrooms Company for a while and he helps, yeah, there you go, and helps formulate <laughs> products. And Real Mushrooms is one of the sponsors for the uh, International Naturally Healthy Pets Experience by All Provide, which will be in Orlando in October. And so we wanted to highlight some of the things that we are seeing from the Real Mushrooms Company. And I, I just love what you guys do and your products are so amazing. All of my animals are on them. My family takes them. <laughs> it's just, I, 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 it's kind of funny in the past probably year, and maybe it's from talking to Joni so much, but um, I have become just a huge mushroom advocate. And I think a lot of it stems from the fact that my little dog with bladder cancer has not needed chemo or any kind of drastic procedures because he's probably on more mushrooms than any dog on the planet right now. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> he, I, I'm, I'm kind of one of those, like, you know, I'm pretty sure I can't kill him with mushrooms. So he yeah. has a lot of mushrooms in his food and it's amazing. So today we're going to focus on um, urinary and kidney health. Um, and so we might have to break that down into a couple of different things because we might use different mushrooms for kidney health versus bladder health. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on which, because there's so many mushrooms that we can choose from and mm -hmm. they all have different properties. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, let's say I have an animal with that's been diagnosed with um, early kidney disease or even late kidney disease. Where where do I head with this? Because if I can cure things with mushrooms, I'm going for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, first, Judy, I wanted to thank you for for having me here today and and allowing me to um, talk about this this passion I have. And, and I also wanted to thank you for the amazing work that you're doing for the pet parents, for the pets, for the vets. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> so um, I wanted to I wanted to start talking about mushrooms in general just a little bit so people have a better understanding of that and and to realize that um, really the use of medicinal mushrooms in our pets is pretty new and it really was dependent upon the launching of products that um, that were available mushroom products that were available versus not just from the Chinese um, um, herbal formulas that we originally were able to get mushrooms from. So a lot of the information is not based on objective research in our pets with these conditions. It's based on historical um, precedent, what we know has, has helped. It's also based on laboratory animal studies, which are using mice and rats, or on human um, clinical trials. And so um, one of the important reasons why I'm doing this and why I'm with real mushrooms is to try to establish these protocols, try to establish what mushrooms are good for what things in pets. I mean, dogs and cats are not just little people. They have very unique properties of their own. And we, and although what might work in a person might not work as well in an animal or might work better. Mm -hmm. So what I'm urging all of the people that are going to be listening to this, because I know you have quite a following, Judy, is that would really love to have feedback about this. And um, the feedback could be directed directly towards me or towards real mushrooms as far as what your successes are with using mushrooms for your pet's issues. Okay. Absolutely. That, that being said, kind of a disclaimer there in a way. Um, so when it comes to problems of the kidney, um, we'll start up top and work our way down. Perfect. Um, the, 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 the primary mushroom that I would recommend based on years of, 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 of using it for this application in humans um, is a mushroom called cordyceps. And cordyceps um, is a very interesting mushroom in that, in how it is, um, how it grows. It's actually a, the, the, um, 
the wild form of cordyceps is a parasite and the spores will parasitize insects, maybe um, moths or maybe ants. And maybe you've been on social, maybe, maybe you've been on the internet and you've seen some of those photographs of these of these ants with mushrooms growing out of their head or, or oh, caterpillars cool. with mushrooms growing out of their head. And, <laughs> and that's, that's, so that's where we get the cordyceps from in the wild. Um, but the, the, the collection of cordyceps in the wild, which we call wild crafting, is depleting the wildly um, grown cordyceps, which grow only on the high steppes of Bhutan, Tibet, and Nepal. And, um, and it's an interesting story about cordyceps that they, the, the, the yak herders in Bhutan and Tibet uh, Tibet and Nepal noticed that in the springtime, their yak would break the tundra, would break the ice, and then would start grazing on the grass that was underneath. And it turned, and the, the, the caterpillars that, that get infected with this spore grow these mushrooms and they come out in the spring. So the yak would, um, would feed on the grass and eat these mushrooms at the same time. And shortly thereafter, they saw that the yaks would go into season. They'd start rutting and they also would have improved fertility. And so those observations, because that's how we learn things in science, is we start with observations. And so those observations led um, many people to believe that cordyceps has some aphrodisiacal properties and also has a positive influence on fertility. And later on, when we actually had science to be able to measure some of the effects of cordyceps, they found that in fact, cordyceps increases testosterone, and also increases um, the good estrogens, the 17, uh, the, the 17 beta estradiol, which is how it helps to improve fertility as well. So there's many other observations about cordyceps because for many years, we, we known through Chinese medicine and through the, the many thousands of years that the Chinese doctors have been able to understand how these herbs work, um, that, um, that cordyceps has um, an influence uh, in certain organs and primarily in the kidney, but also in the lung. So, um, so when we talk about um, using cordyceps in our animals, um, the first species that comes to mind for me is the cat. You know, cats have a much higher incidence of kidney disease. Cats also have feline asthma. And one thing that we know from Chinese medicine is that you can address feel, and I know we're not talking about the lung here, I'm sorry. That's fine. Uh, that, okay. Listen, yeah. in Chinese medicine, the lungs and the kidneys are so intertwined. You can't talk oh about gosh, one without yeah. the other. <laughs> so, so with feline asthma, that's a problem that we recognize in Chinese medicine as the kidneys not supporting the lung. And then you start to get this, um, th that chronic cough. Well, cordyceps is a mushroom that can help with asthma, can help with chronic cough from asthma or from bronchitis as well. But most importantly for our conversation today, there are actually objective evidence-based studies showing that um, cordyceps is able to lower the creatinine in, wow. these, in, these, in these animals and has been used in a few human trials as well. So, you know, but it's having a really good product for a cat makes no freaking difference, pardon my French, <laughs> if they won't take it. And that is why I think cordyceps is so ideal for cats because of the taste. It is very tasty. I don't know if you've tasted it yourself. I have Jim. not tasted the cordyceps. <laughs> oh, I love it. It is my favorite tasting mushroom. Really? I think it tastes a little bit like toast, like, like burnt toast. It has this <laughs> lovely it has this lovely bland flavor, bland and sweet taste. And that's what the TCM, I know you teach TCM energetics and that's what the energetics of it are as well is bland and slightly sweet. Cool. So um, it's, so it's, and, and interestingly enough, cordyceps is related as the, as the type of, from the phylum of, of fungi that it comes from to truffles and morels, mm -hmm. the tasty mushrooms. So this is why it also, I believe, has this good taste as well. Now, our, with real mushrooms, we grow our cordyceps on rice, um, but we, we grow it on the rice, not in the rice. So when we harvest it, there's no rice, no grain in our, in our mushrooms. Um, right. So the, the, the taste of cordyceps is very good. And the, the, the potency of, and I can only speak of the real mushrooms product and I'm not trying to, you know, to market it necessarily. I, I just have the most information and I joined real mushrooms because of their 
because of the quality of the, yeah, of the company and all. Um, so, but it is so potent that for most cats, an eighth of a teaspoon once a day mixed in their food would be an amazing wellness dosage. And we don't really have dosages worked out. And I guess I need to talk about dosages a little bit here too, because it bugs me a little bit that we use the word dosage when we talk about mushrooms, because mushrooms are really what we call functional foods. Right. They're super foods. And, and, and you don't, and there isn't like a dosage that you give. There's a, an approximate starting point that you use. And so I've determined that for, um, that for these mushrooms, about an eighth of a teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight per day is a good place to start with a wellness dosage. And you could then go twice daily with that, depending on the severity and how quickly you want things to work. But it's important for um, your listeners um, your viewers to uh, to understand that mushrooms are food and they're not going to have a drug like an immediate drug like response. You're going to need to wait. You might wait a week if you're lucky, but you may be more likely are going to wait three or four weeks before you have decent effects. Many supplements are like that. Fish oil, for instance, studies show it takes three months at a good dosage of fish oil to get that anti-inflammatory effect. So, um, so, you know, if you're, if you're coming in as stage one, iris stage one, kidney failure, probably an eighth of a teaspoon once a day to begin with to make sure they tolerate it, and then twice a day would be fine. And as you go up each stage, you could then escalate the dosage up an increment from an eighth of a teaspoon to a quarter of a teaspoon, and then, you know, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon twice a day, could even add a third time a day dosage. They're, because they're food, they're, they're very safe. Right. And, and you don't have to worry about too much unless it's a, a digestive issue or a tolerance issue for the individual, for the individual. But um, cordyceps has many other values and, and other than its value on the kidneys, there's a, another gland that's right on top of the kidneys called the adrenal gland. And cordyceps, I mean, I, I love this, this mushroom um, <laughs> and I've really explored it in great depth and I, you know, I take quite a bit of it myself. Um, but um, the adrenal gland that's on top of the um, kidneys is responsible, it's a really our stress organ. And it, it's paired with an organ in our brain called the pituitary, and the two talk back and forth as times in terms of the pituitary secreting um, stimulating hormones for the adrenal gland, the adrenal gland giving feedback and, and everything else. Well, what we have found is that cordyceps is also what we call an adaptogen. And adaptogens are substances that that, that help the adrenal glands and the body to better deal with the with this with stress. And so the other mushroom that's a true adaptogen is reishi. Those are the two mushrooms that are adapted. Just they're interestingly enough, they're also the two mushrooms that have some of the largest effects on um, on the hormones in the body, specifically gonadal hormones. Maitake is another one that has an influence on hormones that way. So um I believe that cordyceps could be used effectively for both Cushing's patients and, and Addison's patients because it helps to balance and harmonize the, the work of the adrenal glands. And right now I'm doing a study. Um, I think um, you know Joyce Harmon. I think oh, yeah. she just recently gave you a class. And so I've got Joyce and Cindy Lankenau, who are both holistic equine practitioners par excellence, working on a little pilot study right now because horses get Cushing's disease. They get something, it's a specific type of Cushing's disease, but they get a Cushing's disease. And so we've been we've been dosing them with the cordyceps and measuring insulin and AC. TH, and then in springtime, we're going to measure again because it's a seasonal occurrence for that. And we'll see if we've got enough information there to warrant a full blast, a full blast study. Oh, I'm excited um, about that because I've got a little mini that, that falls into that category. He may be getting some cordyceps in his food. <laughs> I, I'm also looking for pet parents who, and I'm looking to put a study together. I don't have it. I don't have all the details yet, but I'd like to do a study with cats that have chronic kidney disease with cordyceps. I'd like to prove concept that because I don't have the evidence in cats, it is all suggestive and I think it will work, but you know, I'd like to do it in cats. I'd like to do it in dogs with Cushing's disease. Yeah. And so I've got all with just this one mushroom. So um, I think it's a great mushroom to, to use, not just for the kidneys, but I think for the general health of a cat. And, and that's something that I did with the functional feline is I up the cordyceps substantially in that formula. Cool. So that will be um, welcome when it does, when it does arrive.
that pretty much covers um, cordyceps, which I recommend for the upper uh, for the upper part of the urinary tract, and obviously for many other functions as well, including just plain old wellness, which is not really that plain and old. It's it's an optimal condition that yes, we all it is. strive. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, for bladder issues, it's not as clear as far as specific mushrooms. When we think about bladder, we think about, well, we think about cancer. So that's a little more clear about what we would use. But we also think about crystals and stones, you know, which has, which relates to the pH of the urine. Mm. And there's two types of stones. There's a struvite and oxalate stone. So that brings up an interesting question. Um, you know, and, um, and we think about infection. Right. So um, cancer, stones, infection, that pretty much wraps it up as far as the bladder. So I think when we're, I think mushrooms can provide a really good anti-infective um, benefit um, to the animal, uh, to the human, um, in part because of the beta-glucans that they contain, which stimulate the immune system and do a better job of removing that infection. And all mushrooms have good levels of beta-glucans. So really, if we're looking for the anti-infective property, you could potentially use any mushroom at all. But historically, we have we see a lot of use of the chaga, um, of chaga for, for cystitis, for bladder issues. And chaga um, is actually not a mushroom. <laughs> it's a fungus that grows on a tree and creates a canker. So really the, the chaga is a canker and there's a lot of wood in it. Um, but there's a lot of very powerful triterpenes in it, many of which are de derived from some of the um, from, from, from the birch tree itself that the chaga grows on. It has lower beta glucans, but they're still quite potent. Chaga has been used historically, not just for, for bladder, but more preferentially for cancer. Um, hmm. Alexander Solnitsyn, who was that Nobel Prize, uh, literary prize winning Russian author um, who wrote about the gulag, while he was actually in the gulag, he developed cancer. And he then treated that cancer with chaga, which and chaga grows only at northern latitudes, so it's like a Siberian remedy. It's a Russian remedy. It's a fi Finnish remedy. It's a it's a Canadian remedy. And some of the northern latitudes of the U.S., like uh, Upper Minnesota and, and and Maine and whatnot, also will see that growing. Um, so he wrote about the success of his cancer treatment in his next book, which he called Cancer War. Huh. So I think. So I think chaga could be a good choice. Now, um, there's it's it's important for for your viewers to know that not all not all mushroom products are created the same, and um, the chaga that real mushrooms gathers we get it from Siberia. It's wild crafted. You can't really cultivate chaga in a laboratory. It has to be grown in the wild because it's dependent upon that birch tree. Um, but many companies will take that wood, woody type of, of um, canker, and they'll powder it, you know, powder it and sell it as powder. Now, chaga has some issues with it because it is known to have some oxalates in it. Mm. And oxalates are an issue with urinary tract issues because that's one type of crystal that we get. Plus, if you eat too many oxalates, it can clog up your um, the filtration mechanism in your kidney. You don't want that to happen. Right. So um, chaga that has been hot water extracted, like all of our mushrooms are, and that's a form of, a, in Chinese um, herbal medicine, we call it decoction. And what it is, is it's heating that powder in, in, in water at about 90 degrees centigrade, just below boiling for a couple of hours. And what this does is it breaks the cell wall and releases the beta-glucans and the triterpenes and makes them more available. But it does one other thing as well. Oxalates are extremely soluble. So you do a hot water extraction, you can eliminate those oxalates. But we know this was a problem. So we tested, we tested our chaga for oxalates and there is almost zero soluble oxalates in it. It does and have that some- That is a question that I get from people so often. Like I can't yes. use chaga because my pet has a history of oxalates. And so it is it is critical to, to yes. know yes. that if you are going to use a chaga product, you need to know that it has had that extraction and that the oxalates have been tested. So that's great. Exactly. And that's, that's why I wanted to say that. So yeah, we tested the oxalates 
and they're very low, but there's also insoluble oxalates, but we don't worry about the insoluble oxalates because they're not going to go into solution into the blood and cause problems, you know, eventually to the bladder or to the kidney. So, um, but there's another, there's another urban, not urban myth, but there's another concern about um, chaga. And that's because it derives um, some, some complicated sugars from the birch tree. In, in trees, we don't have glucose, we have xylose. And so, so chaga has that xylose in it or xylan, but it does not have xylitol, which is also a big concern for pet parents. You know, ever since the, the, uh, the, the uh, pet food recall of 2007, pet parents are just really suspicious and rightly so of every little thing. I mean, it takes a lot of work on our part, you know, to, to figure these, to figure out what their questions are asking and find out if it is an issue and then allay their fears if that's in case of what we do. But anyway, so, um, so chaga would be good for that in that regards, but I think other mushrooms would also be good. For instance, the turkey tail is known not just for its effect on cancer, but also its effect on um, infectious agents. Um, and so um, my suggestion is if you're looking at a real mushrooms product for bladder issues, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't depend upon it as a primary treatment for your bladder issues, but I think it's very supportive therapy, would be to look at our five defenders, mm -hmm. which has the turkey tail and has the chaga in it, as well as, you know, several other mushrooms which all have good beneficial effect. The maitake is also known to have some good anti-infective properties. We've just launched the individual maitake in bulk powder like that pouch you're showing and in capsules. Um, but I think in general, maitake, chaga, turkey tail, they're all in the five defenders. That's why that is our most popular um, product. It's it pretty popular. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I, they just don't have any evidence. And, and maybe this is something um, if you're if you're giving chaga to one of your animals, Judy, you might do a UA and tell us what it does to the pH. Because I don't know what it does to the pH. And with with stone, with crystal farming uh, dogs or cats and, and certainly um, cordyceps and chaga are good for dogs if they have this problem. They just have much, well, at least much lower incidence than, than cats do. Um, but I, I don't know what it does to the um to that um, uh, urine pH and whether it does an adequate job, you know, and, and whether it acidifies it, you know, and then we have more of the oxalates or it alkalinizes, we have more of the struvites. Those are important considerations. And, and I've always sent my pet parents home with those, those pH strips for them to just, you know, get a little picture as far as what the pH is of what they're doing. And they could do that with your food therapy, with anything we're doing, especially if the animal's critical about the bladder and those crystals, and maybe if it's a cat in terms of blocking, testing that urine for the pH, I think, on a daily basis. Or yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of urine testing. And yes, we very... carry the urine strips because it's just, it's an easy thing that for yeah. people to do. Um, you know, especially once you do it the first couple of times, it, it, it's collecting the pee the first couple of times, you got to figure out your system. But once you have your system, it's, it's pretty simple. And it's uh, really critical for, for urinary tract health. So that's awesome. Yeah. This may be a bit of digression, <laughs> but what I used to teach, when I'm not in practice anymore, um, but I kind of miss parts of it. But what we used to do is we would take a, a wire hanger and we would straighten it out and make like a little bend at the top with a handle. And then at the bottom, we'd make like a little circle and you could put a Dixie cup in it. And it's yep. long enough that when you're walking your dog and they lift their leg or they go to scoop, you don't get in. You don't have to get in there. You can just put it underneath them and hopefully get enough of a collection to dip that. So, <laughs> so what we did at our clinic is we had a broom handle and we taped oh, a ladle to the bottom. That's smart. And my technicians, let me tell you, they could get urine. It didn't matter if they were squatting flat on the ground. They were so quick with that ladle. Uh, but we actually have a kit here in the, in the warehouse that is an extendable pole oh, that has a little holder like you're talking about with a little Dixie cup type thing that sits in it for collecting the urine. So, and it's so funny because about 15 years ago, I had this idea. I was like, we need a urine collection kit. And in order to ship it, it's going to have to be a collapsible pole. And then, you know, lo and behold, this company did it. And I'm like, well, great. They did it. I don't have to. <laughs> so, yeah, no, and then we cool. have, 
you know, non-absorbent litter for the kitty cats. So yeah. you can, you know, just let them pee in the box and then just dump the, the urine out. Um, okay. So we're, we've got chaga and turkey tail more for the lower urinary tract and cordyceps right. for the upper, which well, I and, love and, and, all you know, that. The, and, and the five defenders, I and think. And the five if, defenders. If you're dealing with um, bladder cancer is good in many regards because it has, it has the anti-cancer benefits. It has the anti-infective benefits and it's all in one. Yep. So, um, that, so what are you giving to your, um, Oh gosh, blood? let me think what my little guy is on. He is on Turkey tail. Mm -hmm. He is on a, the pause mighty mushroom treat, uh, okay. which has multiple mushrooms in it. Yeah. I think I've seen he that. is on, uh, Myco dogs vitality. Okay. And I can't remember which mushrooms are in that. Okay. Um, We've got, what else does he have going into him? He may have some reishi going, he's got reishi going in as well. Okay. Um, but he, and then he's on some CBD and he's on Chinese herbs. And let me tell you, he's had yeah. five tumors in his bladder diagnosed a year ago. And he has oh, no clue that there, I mean, and he was really interesting, Rob, because this, he's 16 and a half now. And oh. about a year ago, I just kept saying, what is wrong with this dog? His tongue is toxic red. And that's what I used to call it in clinic. I was like, this tongue is brick red. It's dry. He's panting. Like there is something serious inside this dog. And so I took lab work in. Everything's normal. I mean, the blood samples all normal, urinalysis normal. And I'm like, there is something going on with this dog. <laughs> And so I finally got him in for an ultrasound. Finding somebody to do the ultrasound without sedation was really difficult. And he also has mitral valve disease because he's, you know, a spaniel. Um, and I finally found somebody to do it without sedation. And they're like, oh, my gosh, he's got five tumors in his bladder. And I'm like, well, that explains why it's not showing up on any lab work. And that explains why he has toxic red tongue. And I got to tell you, since he's been on his protocol with his herbs and, and he's raw fed, um, sure. So on his protocol with his herbs and his mushrooms and his CBD and all the stuff that we're doing, his tongue is that beautiful bubblegum pink. He doesn't pant like there, it, like all of that heat and all that toxicity is gone. Good for you. He, he runs around and plays with the two year olds. Like he's, you know, just one of them. And, it's pretty amazing. And he doesn't even have like incontinence or urgency. And the only thing I haven't done is take him back to get another ultrasound. And the only reason I would put him through it is just so that I could prove to myself, like either. And the funny thing is he has a soft tissue sarcoma on the side of his chest mm. that he's had for probably seven years. Yeah. And with those, I've always been of the mind of you ignore them because if you start digging around, you're going to make them mad and they're going to turn into a nightmare. That thing went from probably like the size of a hard walnut. It's now this smushy, oh, soft, like, like an acorn maybe, but it's smushy and soft mm. and movable. And I'm like, well, if that's what happened to the tumor I can feel, the same thing's got to be happening to the tumors that I can't see and feel. Yeah. So, you know, I'm so impressed with what we can do with herbs and mushrooms and, you know, all this plant medicine that I don't, I don't know why we get stuck in the mud and muck of let's burn, cut, you know, torture when mm -hmm. we can do something else that, you know, my dog just, mm -hmm. he's, he's living life like he did 10 years ago. I mean, he just, it's mm -hmm. no different. So. Yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, a lot of it depends on how the animal presents and, and what the owner's budget and motivation is. Oh yeah. Because there's times but let me tell you, this is a lot cheaper than going to the oncologist and oh, yeah. having all kinds of chemo and rate. I saw my clients that did that and oh, yeah. it's just like, Oh my gosh. Like I, I don't want to put him through it. I don't want to put me through it. And this is, it's a lot less expensive to throw mushrooms. at him. <laughs> well, I agree. But, but you know, there are times when, um, when the mushrooms aren't enough for the condition and the condition True. may kill the animal before the mushrooms or other stuff can work. And again, depending on the, the pet parents motivation, budget and, yep. and, and desires, um, sometimes using some of those awful poisons or surgery 
um, extends their life long enough that we can then, you know, use get other things to, yeah. to, yeah. to extend it. But yeah. yeah. I kind of, I mean, I had no choice. He was, his was not operable. So yeah, that, just, that was off the table right away. I so it's like, matters. okay. Um, so, but he's, he's been a nice little experiment and, uh, all of my animals teach me yeah. a lot. So, and that's good to know, Judy, I, this is, this is part of what I'm saying that, you know, this anecdotal report from you that the soft tissue sarcoma softened with the use of the 5d and everything else you're doing makes me feel better about rec because I've, they're very resistant to anything, those soft tissue sarcomas, you know, so um, that makes it me more likely to recommend something like that. You know, yeah. probably the CBD had a big factor as well. And the Chinese herb, which, yeah. you know, which Chinese herb formula you're using? Oh man, he's on Son Lang, I believe. Okay. And, uh, oh gosh, I'm not going to remember the other one. And then he's also on, um, turmeric. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's got more supplements. He's on Moringa, the, uh, crazy at uh, the, uh, cocoa therapy girls turned me on to Moringa. And okay. I said, well, it's got great medicinal benefits. So mm -hmm. No problem. That's <laughs> the better question would be, what isn't he on? <laughs> Pretty much. Like I go through the warehouse. He, he needs a vitamin D supplement because he's got low vitamin D, which most cancer pets do. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is his mitral valve. We've also been able to keep him off medications. Nice. He's got a grade five murmur, um, but he's he's been able to stay off medications for that as well. So I think the combination of diet and supplements just, you know, in, in my mind, the longer I can keep him drug free, then if I need to go to the drugs, they're going to be effective oh, because he hasn't been on them for years and years and years. So yeah. anyway, it's working and I'm happy with it, but thank you for all of this That's information. Nice. Mm -hmm. This is, um, you see, you're a science nerd and you love to read all the studies, and, but, <laughs> but then when you present them, it's, it's always very, like, I love your lectures because it's always very down to earth and useful, usable, like everyday information. Thank, so thank you. I, 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 I appreciate that you're able to do that. <laughs> well, you know, when I was younger, I was trying to decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I didn't really know, but for some reason I, I thought to myself that I just want to be able to explain complicated things in a simple way. And that exactly. does seem to be my special power because people yeah. tell me that I'm able to present complicated problems in a simple way. I've been, I've been doing things on the pet summit. I just did a workshop, a, a two day workshop on gut health and allergies and did one before that in December on mushrooms and CBD. And, and I'm having a lot of fun putting these things together and, and, because I, because up till now, you know, I was in the vet realm, you know, with RX vitamins, and now I'm in the pet realm, and I'm enjoying it, and just kind of learning, learning how to do what I need to do. Here. Yep. But I've seen your vet lectures too, and like I sit down, and there's this slide up with you know chemical reactions and chemistry and stuff, and I'm like, oh my god. And then you explain it, and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, I like to use the slides more as cue cards. I don't want yeah. people. To have learn what's on the slide. You just want them to see what they see there. I did, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, biochem 101, the nightmares. That's that's actually the uh, the uh, college class that I have the most nightmares about is biochem. Uh, my, my, my daughter's a biochem major right now. Oh my now. God. <laughs> Pre-med biochem. And, actually, and I appreciate it a lot more now uh, where yeah. I can see that it has some usefulness. But at the time I was just like, I'm tired of memorizing things. Anyway, thank you very much, Rob. We yeah. appreciate uh, the brains in your head that are so amazing. And we appreciate you taking time to teach us thank all that.